Welcome back. This is our first podcast on the mass media in the public agenda. In today's podcast, we will be looking at the mass media today and the development of media politics. Our learning objectives are as follows. One, describe how American politicians choreograph their messages through the mass media. And two, Outline the key developments in the history of mass media and American politics. So let's begin. The American political system has entered a new period of high-tech politics, in which the behavior of citizens and policymakers, as well as the political agenda itself, is increasingly shaped by technology. The mass media are a key part of that technology. Television, radio, newspapers, magazines, and other means of popular communications are called mass media because they reach out and profoundly influence not only the elites but the masses. Within this chapter you will see historical developments of mass media as it relates to news coverage of government and politics. Questions regarding how news is defined, how it is presented, and what impact it has in politics are also addressed. The mass media today. Modern political success depends upon control of the mass media. Image making does not stop with the campaign. It is also a critical element in day-to-day governing since politicians' images in the press are seen as good indicators of their clout. Politicians have learned that one way to guide the media's focus successfully is to limit what they can report on to carefully scripted events, a media event. A media event is staged primarily for the purpose of being covered. A large part of today's so-called 30-second presidency is the slickly produced TV commercials. Few, if any, administrations devoted so much effort and energy to the president's media appearance as did Ronald Reagan's. The Reagan White House operated on the following seven principles. 1. Plan ahead. 2. Stay on the offensive. 3. Control the flow of information. 4. Limit reporters' access to the president. 5. Talk about the issues you want to talk about. 6. Speak in one voice and seven repeat the same message many times the development of media politics the daily newspaper is largely a product of the late nineteenth century while radio and television have been around only since the first half of the twentieth century as recently as the presidency of herbert hoover nineteen twenty nine to nineteen thirty three Reporters submitted their questions to the president in writing, and he responded in writing, if at all. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 1933-1945, to was the first president to use the media effectively. Roosevelt held about 1,000 press conferences in his 12 years in the White House and broadcast a series of fireside chats over the radio to reassure the nation during the Great Depression. At the time of Roosevelt's administration, the press had not yet started to report on a political leader's public life. The events of the Vietnam War and the Watergate scandal soured the press on the government. Today's news people work in an environment of cynicism. The press sees Ferretting 
out the truth as their job since they believe that politicians rarely tell the whole story. Investigative journalism, the use of detective-like reporting methods to unearth scandals, pits reporters against politicians. There is evidence that TV's fondness for investigative journalism has contributed to greater political cynicism and negativism about politics. To explore the development of media politics, we need to distinguish between two kinds of media. The print media, which includes newspapers and magazines, and the electronic media, which include radio, television, and the internet. Each has reshaped political communication at different points in American history. In this picture you see the importance journalists assign to various roles of the mass media. The White House press secretary battles daily with the press corps. The print media. The first American daily newspaper was printed in Philadelphia in 1783, but daily newspapers did not become common until the technological advances of the mid-19th century. Rapid printing and cheap paper made the penny press possible, a paper that could be bought for a penny and read at home. By the 1840s, the telegraph permitted a primitive wire service, which relayed news stories from city to city faster than ever before. The Associated Press, founded in 1849, depended heavily on this new technology. Two newspaper magnates, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, enlivened journalism around the turn of the century. This was the era of yellow journalism, where the main topics were sensationalized accounts of violence, corruption, war, and gossip. Newspapers consolidated into chains during the early part of the 20th century. Today's massive media conglomerates control newspapers with 78% of the nation's daily circulation. These chains often control television and radio stations as well. Among the most influential newspapers today are the New York Times, a cut above most newspapers in its influence and impact almost from the beginning, the Washington Post, perhaps the best coverage inside Washington, and papers from a few major cities such as the Chicago Tribune and the Los Angeles Times. For most newspapers in medium-sized and small towns, the main source of national and world news is the Associated Press wire service. Magazines. The political content of leading magazines is pretty slim. News weeklies such as Time, Newsweek, and U.S. News and World Report rank well behind popular favorites such as Reader's Digest, TV Guide, and National Geographic. Serious news magazines of political news and opinion such as The New Republic, The National Review, and The Commentary are primarily read by the educated elite. The Emergence of Radio and Television The broadcast media have gradually, gradually displaced the print media as America's principal source of news and information. Radio was invented in 1903. The first modern commercial radio station was Pittsburgh KDKA, whose first broadcast was of the 1920 Harding Cox presidential election returns. As a form of technology, television 
is almost as old as radio. The first television station appeared in 1931. Nevertheless, the 1950s and 60s were the developmental years for American television. The first televised presidential debates were the, were the 1960 Kennedy-Nixon debates. The poll results from this debate illustrate the visual power of television in American politics. Whereas people listening to the radio gave the edge to Nixon, those who saw it on television thought Kennedy won. Television took the nation to the war in Vietnam during the 1960s, and TV exposed governmental naivete. Some said it was outright lying about the progress of the war. With the growth of ta cable TV, particularly the cable news network, CNN, television has entered a new era of bringing news to people and to political leaders, as it happens. Since 1963, surveys have consistently shown that more people rely on TV for the news than any other medium. And by a regular two to one margin, people think television reports are more believable than newspaper stories. Young people are particularly likely to rely on television as opposed to newspapers for their news. Government Regulations of Electronic Media In 1934, Congress created the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, to regulate the use of the airways. Today, the FCC regulates communications via radio, television, telephone, cable, and satellite. The FCC is an independent regulatory body, but in practice it is subject to many political pressures. The FCC has regulated the airways in three important ways. First, to prevent near monopolies of control over a broadcast market. The FCC has instituted rules to limit the number of stations owned or controlled by one company. Since a simplification in 1996, the rule has been just that no single owner can control more than 35% of the broadcast market. Second, the FCC conducts periodic examinations of the goals and performance of stations as part of its licensing authority. Congress long ago stipulated that in order to receive a broadcasting license, a station must serve the public interest. The FCC has on only rare occasion withdrawn licenses for failing to do so, as when a Chicago station lost its license for neglecting informational programs and for presenting obscene movies. Third, the FCC has issued a number of fair treatment rules concerning access to the airwaves for political candidates and office holders. The equal time rule stipulates that if a station sells advertising to one candidate, it must be willing to sell equal time to the other candidates for the same office. And the right of reply rule states, if a person is attacked on a broadcast other than the news, then that person has the right to reply via the same station. From broadcasting to narrowcasting, the rise of cable and cable news. With the increase in cable channels and internet usage, a recent trend has been the increase in broadcast channels that are oriented towards particularly narrow audiences often referred to as narrow casting. Traditional broadcast news is being particularly replaced by political websites, 
bloggers, and even John Stewart's The Daily Show. With so many readily available sources of information, cable, satellite, internet, etc., for so many specific interests, it will also be extremely easy for those who are not very interested in politics to completely avoid news and public affairs. Further, scholars are not impressed with the news value of most of what is broadcast on cable news networks. At the same time, those who are interested can now access far more information than before due to limitless possibilities of the internet and the democratization of the news through blogging and other trends. The result could well be an increasingly inequality of political information, with the politically interested becoming even more knowledgeable while the rest of the public slips further into political apathy. Private Control of the Media Because of private ownership of the media and the First Amendment right to free speech, American journalists have long had an unfettered capacity to criticize government leaders and policies. Although the American media are independent when it comes to journalistic, journalistic content, they are totally dependent on advertising revenues to keep their businesses going. Private ownership means that getting the biggest possible audience is the primary objective. Media in America today tend to be part of large conglomerates. Only a relatively small number of television stations are publicly owned in America, and these PBS stations play a minimal role in the news business, attracting low ratings. In contrast, in many other countries, major TV networks are owned by the government. In the newspaper business, chains such as Gannett, Knight Rider, and Newshouse control newspapers that together represent over 80% of the nation's daily circulation. This concludes our first podcast on the mass media and the political agenda. In today's podcast, we focused on the mass media today and the development of media politics. Our learning objectives were as follows. 1. Describe how American politicians choreograph their messages through the mass media. 2. Outline the key developments in the history of mass media and American politics. Tune in for our next podcast on the mass media and the political agenda in which we will be looking at reporting the news and the news and public opinion. Thank you for tuning in today.